Okay, so good morning, everyone. It's already nine o'clock. It's time to start our lecture. Before we go on, uh, I would like to remind you about the second problem sheet. Um, the deadline is, I think, this Friday. And moreover, there will be a new problem sheet relatively soon, either this week or next week at the latest. Yeah. Uh, maybe I will begin by reminding you what we did the last time. Okay, here it is. So last time we were discussing uh, a, a new notion, notion of pseudo Riemannian manifolds. Uh, maybe let me make a big screen. Can you see everything? Can you see my pointer and so on? Yes. I, can, I guess you can. Okay, very well. Uh, so we were discussing the notion of pseudo Riemannian and Riemannian manifolds. These are manifolds which are not just bare sets of points, they have a metric tensor defined at every point, or a tensor which is uh, of valence zero two, it's symmetric and it's non-degenerate. Uh, because of the Sylvester's law of inertia, we can always find everywhere a diagonalizing basis of this tensor, which then defines the signature or the number of minus ones and plus ones in the Sylvester's uh, canonical form. Uh, yeah. We will be in this lecture. We will mainly work with space times of Lorentzian signature minus one 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 because this is exactly what kind of signature uh, we expect in the space time. We also started introducing the notion of connection, covariant derivative, and parallel transport. Uh, this is an additional gadget, an additional device we need if we want to compare vectors, tensors, and other geometric objects at finite distances, or even at inf uh, infinitesimal distances. Uh, the thing is that, as we discussed some time ago, tensors at different points live basically on different spaces, and a priori there is no way to compare them with each, with each other. In order to be able to compare at least ones which are infin infinitesimal close to each other, so uh, one is displaced with respect to the other by some kind of delta x, uh, times epsilon as a very small number. Even for this purpose, we need an additional device called connection. And this device defines a couple of other important uh, notions, the notion of covariant derivative, the notion of parallel transport, and the choice of local initial frame. And we will talk about this in this lecture. Uh, it turns out that if we have a metric on our manifold, we already have a separate connection called the Levi-Civita or metric connection. Uh, we discussed how we choose a connection. Basically, we take uh, a vector basis, typically a coordinate basis of vectors. We assume that the covariant derivatives in all possible directions are given by some combination of these vectors. And we call the con combination coefficients the connection coefficients. Uh, in that case, we have a well-defined definition of covariant derivatives of vectors, one forms, scalars, uh, and also general tensors using these gamma coefficients, connection coefficients. So choosing gammas is equivalent to giving uh, a method to differentiate covariantly tensors uh, and vectors. Uh, we also noticed that gamma as a geometric object is not a tensor. It does not quite transform like a tensor. Namely, the transformation law involves a second derivative of the uh, new coordinate system in terms of the uh, first, in terms of the old one. Uh, but this matches very nicely the transformation law of the standard derivative of a vector, coordinate by coordinate, uh, and just taking the partial derivatives of each coordinate. This is also a geometric object, but it does not transform as a tensor either. However, when you take both together, we obtain the covariant derivative that is something that transforms as a tensor of slightly higher valence. And as a first new thing, I would like us to uh, derive the transformation law for the connection coefficients, because I think this is something quite important. We'll do this on a blackboard. So I will share my screen again. So we are deriving the transformation law for the connection coefficients. And just recall, so we assume that we've got one coordinate system x mu, 
another one while you uh, with a hat uh, and a set of functions. We also have the Jacobian um, that's x mu over y mu bar over here and the inverse Jacobian equal to y mu bar over x mu. And now the definition of the connection coefficient was that if we take the covariant derivative of the appropriate coordinate basis, I'm using a bulk index to denote uh, uh, index of the basis. Not component. <clears throat> and this is equal to gamma beta alpha mu e beta. On the other hand, we also know that the uh, that if we pass to any coordinate system we generally pass from E alpha, one set of uh, vectors related to the coordinates X mu to the vectors related to coordinates Y mu. And the appropriate formula takes this form. Uh, and it's easy to check that this has to hold because we've got, we know that each vector can be written down as a sum of its components even in a given coordinate times the coordinate basis. But at the same time, this has to be, this has to also work in the new coordinate basis. Uh, we have the transformation law that x mu bar is lambda mu bar mu x mu. If we combine these two, it's easy to derive this, um, this relation here. Uh, there should be a, an over bar over here. Okay, so now the question is, what, is, what are the connection coefficients uh, in the new coordinates? So what we are what we need to do is to calculate nabla mu bar e alpha bar and then decompose this in terms of uh, our new frame. So differentiation with respect to mu bar, we can try it to the standard differentiation with respect to mu just by including the Jacobian. And here we remember that this is nothing else but lambda alpha, alpha bar e alpha. This is a vector, and these are just coefficients. So differentiating the coefficients gives the standard derivatives. Differentiating the vector will give us the covariant derivative. So here we get lambda mu mu bar lambda alpha alpha bar mu e alpha plus lambda mu mu bar lambda alpha alpha bar nabla mu e alpha but this is just gamma beta alpha mu e this thing over here. Uh, okay. Uh, we can trade this guy and this guy for the appropriate uh, bar vectors. If we again apply this formula over here. Uh, 
lambda alpha bar alpha e alpha bar. Uh, sorry, we should not use alpha bar here. Uh, alpha bar is already in use, so we should use, let's say, kappa bar alpha e of kappa bar. Uh, this is something very important. If we have already used alpha and alpha bar as, as a component, as an external index, we may not use it as a summation index because th this creates an ambiguous expression. So I have to use kappa when I want to express this using uh, the new basis. And then I also play the same game over here. Uh, this time I can also use kappa bar. Eta, e kappa bar. Yes, we are almost there. Let's go to the next board. So from this, we can show that gamma beta bar, let's say alpha bar mu bar, that's just gamma beta alpha mu lambda alpha alpha bar lambda mu, mu bar lambda beta bar beta. This is basically a tensorial law of transformation, but unfortunately it doesn't end here. We also have lambda mu mu bar lambda alpha alpha bar mu lambda beta bar Alpha. Uh, that's all. We are almost done. Just one more thing. We would like to express this a, a little bit differently. Uh, we will just use the fact that lambda alpha alpha bar and the inverse Jacobian lambda alpha bar kappa. We should give always a unit matrix a delta. We differentiate this with respect to mu. And we quickly find out that lambda alpha alpha bar mu lambda alpha bar kappa plus lambda alpha alpha bar lambda alpha bar kappa mu, this is zero, or lambda alpha lambda alpha bar kappa mu, this is minus lambda. We have to multiply it by the inverse matrix over here. So we get here um, the alpha bar sigma lambda sigma alpha bar. Let me do it in some motion. We would like to obtain an expression for this guy over here. So we have lambda alpha alpha bar mu lambda alpha bar kappa that's minus lambda alpha alpha bar lambda alpha bar kappa mu we now multiply everything by some, some kind of lambda kappa beta bar this gets rid of this term here it changes into lambda alpha alpha bar mu delta alpha bar beta bar and here we get minus lambda alpha alpha bar lambda alpha bar kappa mu lambda kappa beta bar. That's nice. Or lambda alpha beta bar mu is equal to minus lambda alpha alpha bar lambda alpha bar kappa mu lambda kappa beta bar. And now the trick is to substitute this thing here. There's just one uh, index, which is which is called differently, beta bar instead of alpha bar, but you can perform the substitution. And if you do it, I will not show you because this is kind of trivial. You get the standard textbook formula for this transformation law. So first you've got this tensor-like 
term. But then there is an inhomogeneous part to it. We just found that this about, let's say, cup on you. Lambda kappa alpha bar lambda mu, mu bar. Okay. And that's nothing else but the second derivative of my beta with respect to x kappa and x mu. So the transformation law indeed contains a second order part. Okay. Uh, any questions regarding this derivation? Okay, I don't see any. So let's go back to the lecture. So uh, the transformation law for this particular combination, x together with uh, derivative of x together with gamma, that's that behaves exactly like a tensor under coordinate transformation. This is indeed a good choice of a, a covariant derivative. Okay, but I promise that we can somehow, we don't have to assume a new um, connection if we have a metric. We can we can obtain a metric there, we can obtain a connection directly from the metric. How how can we do it? Well, we will try to mimic the flat space time. Remember that in flat space time or in, in, in Euclidean geometry, we also had some kind of covariant derivative that was the standard derivative, but in Cartesian coordinates. In the general manifold, we don't have Cartesian coordinates, but Cartesian coordinates, but still we, we can assume something that sort of mimics this behavior. So first we'll assume that the connection is so-called torsion-free, meaning that the coefficients of this connection are symmetric with respect to lower indices. That's equivalent to saying that the covariant derivative of a function, second covariant derivative of a function is symmetric with respect to the two indices here, just the way we expect standard derivative to behave. And a more interesting assumption we make is that Recall that in this Cartesian coordinates, the metric is always constant. It's just it's some kind of minus one plus one plus one plus one. If it's constant in Cartesian coordinates, it means that its covariant derivative is equal to zero. We can impose this condition also in a non-flat space time. And it turns out that these two assumptions, one and two, are enough uh, to define one single connection given by this, uh, this equation over here. This is a very important equation, and if you want to pass the exam, you'll need to remember it because it's, it's it's an important formula for the connection coefficients of a metric connection, also known as, known as the Christoffel symbols. So if we assume that the connection is torsion-free, free, if we assume that, assume that the covariant derivative of the metric vanishes, then there is only one connection which satisfies these requirements, and it's this one written over here, expressed in terms of the derivatives of the metric at a given point and the inverse metric. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, if not, then we will derive this equation over here because I think it's quite important. Um, and also the derivation is kind of nice. It shows you what kind of tricks you can play with uh, indices. Okay, here we are again. Okay, so let me Beta or metric connection. The assumptions we have made are the following. We assume that the covariant derivative of the metric tensor is equal to zero. And two, that the connection itself is symmetric. It's fairly easy to show that if it is symmetric in one coordinate system. It is symmetric in all coordinate systems. From the uh, from the transformation law we have derived just a minute ago, but we'll not do it here. Now, I claim that under this is basically equivalent to stating that gamma alpha mu nu is equal to g alpha beta 
which is beta mu zero plus g beta mu zero minus g mu mu beta. Proof. And we'll go in this direction. So from these two assumptions, we go here. We begin by writing explicitly what this equation means in terms of the gamma coefficients. We've got the, the standard derivative of the metric in these coordinates, the covariant derivative, followed by minus gamma beta, let's say mu alpha g beta nu. So we have to add appropriate gamma terms uh, with the minus sign because this is a contravariant tensor with lower indices. So for each lower index, mu and mu, we have to add this term. Okay. And now we would like to obtain an expression explicitly for gamma. The problem is that there's two gammas here. Um, and it seems rather difficult to somehow disentangle the, the, the components of one from the other. But there's a trick here. And the trick is kind of nice, and, and the one which is not so easy to see. Uh, you have to know it, basically. So let, let's write down the same equation again, but this time permuting the indices. So instead of mu, we will write mu. Instead of mu, we will write alpha. And instead of alpha, we write mu. So there's a cyclic permutation of indices, or at least the lower indices. We are not changing the summation indices. So mu goes to mu, uh, alpha goes to mu, alpha goes to mu, and mu goes to alpha, minus gamma beta, uh, mu goes to alpha, alpha goes to mu, mu goes to mu. And that's not the end of the story, we do it again. This time mu goes to alpha, Alpha goes to mu, mu goes to mu. We're just renaming the external indices. This is basic. Each of these equations is basically the same equations, just written in terms of slightly different, slightly renamed indices. So there's nothing fishy about that. It might just look a little silly at first, and you might not see why we're doing that. Just, just repeating the same equation in a slightly different language. There is a reason, and you will see it in a second. And now here's the trick. Uh, we take these equations and add this one to this one, but subtract also that one. And you will see what will happen. So on the left-hand side, we get g mu mu alpha plus g mu alpha mu minus g alpha mu mu. I mean, we, all, all these three equations are true because they're the same equations, just written in slightly different uh, language. And now let's also take some colors. Now let's look for terms which will cancel each other out. So there is this term over here. And since the connection and the metric are symmetric with respect to the index change, this is the same as the term over here. But that's not the end of the story. In this term over there, gamma nu alpha uh, lower index mu beta, it has a counterpart over here. It's the same term, just with different order of indices at each of these objects, at the metric of, and, and the connection. But since they're both symmetric, that doesn't really matter. And in the end, we take this one. And that one, again, they're identical when you look at that. So what happens when we take this combination over here? Uh, so this guy needs that guy, but they come with different signs, so they cancel out. Uh, let's write it down this way and this way. Uh, this guy needs that guy, and again, they come with opposite signs, so they cancel out as well. This one with that one. However, these guys are identical and they come with the same sign, so they produce twice the same thing. 
Margo should be able to talk to you. And this is equal to zero. And now we are, we are very close. Uh, we just shift this, um, this term to one side. Leave these terms on the other side. And the last point, the last trick we need to play is to multiply both sides with, let's say, one half. And we need to get rid of this metric here. So the best trick would be to multiply it by some kind of inverse metric. And this way, you can easily show that in the end, you obtain this equation here. OK, that was a bit tricky. The bottom line is that if we if you take this combination, you get only one term uh, with gamma contract with the metric, and then solving for this for the co individual coefficients of gamma becomes very easy. Any questions to this proof? Okay, if there are no questions, then that's very good. We have done the proof one way. I will leave the the second part of the of the of the theorem uh, for you. So you need to check that indeed if we take gamma of this form, it satisfies both of these conditions. I mean the first the second one is fairly easy. The first one takes a little bit more care, but it's also true because so far we have only shown that if this is true, then that is true. But we also would like to see that if we indeed assume that the metric has this form, the metric is covariantly constant, and this is symmetric. It, it is absolutely true, and it's rather easy to verify, but we will not do it here. OK, let's go back to the lecture. Okay, uh, this uh, this equation looks strange, but in fact, it's it's fairly easy to remember. You just need to remember that the expression we want to, we want to obtain has to be symmetric with respect to the two lower indices alpha and beta. So the term with a minus contains alpha g alpha beta nu, which is symmetric by itself because the metric is symmetric with respect to these two indices, and here. Uh, these two terms are not, not symmetric by themselves, but we add them up together with, with opposite positions of the indices alpha and beta. So there is a symmetrization going on here. Uh, yeah, these gammas are also known as Christopher symbols. Okay, now choosing a connection is equivalent to choosing a class of special coordinate systems at each point. Uh, what do I mean by that? So imagine we pick up a point P, uh, which corresponds to x mu equal to zero in our coordinate chart. Uh, and at P, we have non-vanishing connection coefficients. It, it just happens to be in our coordinate system. Uh, we introduce new coordinates uh, such that, again, the position of this point P corresponds to zero. This is just an arbitrary choice, but we can always make it. Uh, we assume that the first derivative of our new components with, with respect to the old ones is, is just delta, a unit matrix. So the, the, the Jacobian is the unit matrix at point P. However, the second derivatives are given precisely by the gamma coefficients. Note that these, these coefficients are symmetric with respect to lower indices. So we get in the symmetric matrix of second derivatives as we should. And we take any coordinate system which has this type of Taylor expansion. Because this is a Taylor expansion. We've got the value at point P, its first derivative and second derivative. Uh, we can now apply this ugly formula for the code for the transformation of gammas. And if we do it, we discover very quickly that in these new coordinates, the connection coefficients disappear, all of the all of the uh, all of its components. Uh, or what, what is equivalent. In these coordinates, the covariant derivative is just the standard derivative, at least at this one single point. So we can, as, as mathematicians say, 
we can easily kill the connection at a single point by a slight change of our coordinate system, a small alteration of the second derivative. We'll call uh, coordinates which satisfy this property locality of coordinates. The thing is that at one single point, it's fairly easy to do. You just have to make sure that the second derivative of your, of your components is equal to gammas. Let's look at the metric in the coordinates. Uh, for a Levy Civita connection, the metric in, in the new coordinates will, will look the following. Uh, obviously, the covariant derivative and the standard derivative are the derivative with respect to uh, standard components, the, the uh, standard partial derivatives. That's the same thing in our locally flat coordinates at the point P. This is supposed to be zero, so the first derivative. Uh, of the components G mu nu with respect to alpha also has to be equal to zero. So the Taylor expansion for the metric is basically the value of the metric at the point P plus additional terms without any linear term, only quadratic terms are allowed. So in these new coordinates, metric is constant up to the second um, term in the Taylor series. There is one more maneuver we can do. We can make a small linear transformation of uh, the co coordinates y alpha to some kind of z mu. A is a, a constant coefficient. It's easy to, to check that uh, this is, again, this type of transformation does not spoil the property of the, of the new coordinate system. It's still locally flat and gamma is still equal to zero. However, we can use this additional transformation uh, matrix A nu alpha uh, to diagonalize our metric tensor and make it equal to, let's say, eta mu nu. So a matrix of minus one plus one plus one plus one. So in the end, we obtain a coordinate system at a, at a given point in which the metric is the metric as we have in the Minkowski space, plus additional terms which are of quadratic order. There is no linear perturbations. And that's very nice. It means that very close to this point in these coordinates, our manifold looks pretty much like a slice of a Minkowski space in Cartesian coordinates. So G mu nu is eta mu nu. If we uh, narrow down the domain in which we use this coordinate system sufficiently, uh, these new terms will be negligible and basically will end up in a Minkowski space. The metric is constant, uh, the derivative the covariant derivative is just the standard partial taking standard partial derivatives of, of the components. We're just like in the Minkowski space. So Z mu constructed this way is a great candidate for what we call the local inertial framework because it looks exactly like the Minkowski space. Any questions? Okay, we don't have any. Uh, so we have defined the covariant derivative. Uh, let me just review a few of its properties, which I think are quite important. So if we have a covariant derivative with respect to the metric connection, there is a couple of properties which we need to hold, and we will use them during this lecture quite extensively, so it's good to remember them. So if we have a tensor product of two tensors, let's say T and S with multiple indices, and we take the covariant derivative of that, and this is basically the sum of the covariant derivative, covariant derivative of t times s plus t times covariant derivative of s. So the standard rule for the derivative of product holds for tensor products of tensors in, under covariant differentiation, which is nice. And in particular, this also works if you have a tensor multiplied by a scalar, which is a degenerate type of tensor. Namely, differentiation is just taking the standard derivative of f times the tensor plus F covariant derivative of the tensor. Mm. As we stated, if we have a metric connection, the, the covariant derivative of the metric vanishes. It's also easy to see that the covariant derivative of this type of unit tensor, delta mu nu, this also has to vanish no matter what. But it's easy to see that if you combine these two properties, it's also true that the covariant derivative of the uh, inverse matrix metric has to vanish. Uh, then there's another property. 
which sort of follows from the previous one. Uh, so taking covariant derivatives commutes with index raising and lowering. Commutes simply means that it doesn't matter in which order we perform the operation of index lowering and raising and taking the covariant derivative, the result is the same. And that's very good because it means that our notation is not ambiguous. Imagine you've got a vector of x mu and we write down something, something this mu has, has uh, an upper index, but we write down the covariant derivative with respect to the lower index. Now, what is that? This is a potentially ambiguous thing. This could either mean that we first lower the index of this x and they, then take the covariant derivative of the resulting one form. But this could also mean that we take the derivative of our vector field, we obtain a, a, a derivative of with one index, uh, one upper index and one lower index, but we simply lower it with the metric later. These are, strictly speaking, two different expressions, but fortunately, exactly because the, this metric is covariantly constant, there is no derivative over here. This is not, the result of these two operations is the same. So what we write here is, is not ambiguous. It, it has a well-defined value independently of how we calculate that. Uh, apart from that, it also commutes with contracting indices. So if you have a tensor, and you take the covariant derivative of a tensor with two um, indices contracting each other, let's say the first and the second here. This could either mean that we take the contraction and then take the covariant derivative of, of this expression, or that we take the covariant derivative of the tensor before performing the contraction and later contract. But again, thanks to the property over here, it doesn't really matter in which order we do it. So this is not an ambiguous. This, this thing here is not ambiguous. Uh, any questions? Okay, it's either so simple that everybody knows everything or it's, it's so mysterious that nobody even asks a question. Uh, okay, another object I wanted to talk about is called the parallel transport. So, in a flat space time, if we had a point, if you have the vector at a particular point, this vector was not really all that much assigned to this point. We could easily move it around, right? A vector with Cartesian coordinates one to three is we can imagine it, we can imagine it at a slightly different point or somewhere else. It was fairly easy to to, to move vectors around. This is obviously not true in curved space times or in, or in general manifolds. Uh, it turns out that if you want to move your vector by a finite distance from one point to another, uh, you have to use something called a parallel transport. First, you have to fix a curve along which you move your, your vector. So you have to ha have a, a curve through your point P. So you imagine you've got a vector Y at P. You choose a, a, a curve through this point, X mu of lambda. Let's say that at lambda equal to zero, we are at P. Uh, this curve has a tangent vector, dx mu over d lambda. And now what we can do is to solve an ordinary differential equation. Uh, we define the power transport of this vector along this curve as a solution of an ordinary differential equation. We write it as y, y tilde of lambda. And here is the equation. The derivative of this vector in direction of x dot which is just x dot mu number of u, uh, is supposed to be equal to zero. And then the initial data, we also impose the initial data at the point P. Our y tilde is supposed to be the y we, we start from. Um, this may look a little bit mysterious. What I mean here by, by this, what I write here is, is, is this ordinary differential equation. We take the ordinary derivative of the components of y mu of this vector y plus gamma, the connection coefficients, y alpha x dot beta. This is supposed to be equal to zero. The geometric interpretation of this ODE is that ordinary differential equation is that um, in locally flat coordinates, it simply means that at each point, the, the appropriate components are supposed to be constant. So at the point P and at every point along this curve, we can, we can find uh, locally flat coordinates. And in these locally flat coordinates, the components of the 
um, of this vector by mu of its parallel transport are conserved. However, we typically work in a different coordinate system in which this equation is a bit more complicated than that. Okay. Any questions to the parallel transport? No, I don't hear any. Uh, this is a formula for general tensors. You can also perform parallel transport of any tensor you can, you can, you can think of uh, by taking, again, the standard derivative in a coordinate system of these T mu nu alpha beta of lambda, but adding and subtracting appropriate gamma related terms. These are basically gammas, again, contracted with each of the upper and each of the lower indices over here. And with x dot rho or the tangent vector uh, also contracted over here. Uh, for the metric tensor, it turns out that the parallel transport of the metric tensor is al always the metric tensor itself. So if you take the metric tensor at P, parallel transport along any curve to any other place, you, you just recover the metric tensor at this place. So uh, in a sense, moving around, parallel transporting the, the metric is kind of a useless exercise because what you get is just a metric at a different place. But it doesn't work for other tensors. Uh, another important property is that the product of two vectors is always conserved when parallel transporting. If we start with two vectors, y and x, parallel transport them along any curve, that the product of the parallel transported images is always the same and is equal to the product at point P. It's also possible to show that the con contracting, raising, and lowering indices commutes with the parallel transport in the sense that uh, you can take your initial vector y, lower its index, parallel transport your, your uh, this quantity as a one form, obtain its image at a different point, and then raise the index using the metric there. This is perfectly equivalent to parallel transporting it as a vector. And the same goes with the uh, with contraction of indices. Okay. So now the last part of this of this lecture, geodesics. So if you have a metric tensor on your manifold, you also have a covariant derivative. And if you have a covariant der derivative, you, you have a special 2n parameter family of curves defined by the geometry. n is the dimension of the manifold. So you have the counterpart of lines, straight lines in standard Euclidean or Minkowski geometry. Uh, these are curves which are defined uniquely by specifying a point through which they, 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 which they are supposed to cross and then also specifying a tangent vector giving the direction in which this line is supposed to go. And the idea is that the curves we're talking about should look like straight lines in locally flat, flat coordinates uh, at any point we pass. So if we have the point P, we can introduce our locally flat coordinates in the vicinity of this point P. And in these coordinates at this particular point, uh, the ordinary differential equation is simply that the second derivative of x mu over lambda is equal to zero, just as if you had a straight line. But we typically don't use uh, local flat coordinates around each point. We rather fix a coordinate system over a large part of the manifold. And in that case, this formula right here is, is equivalent to this one over here. So the second derivative of x mu with respect to the affine parameter is equal to plus gamma. And this gamma is then contracted with the tangent vector, this is supposed to be zero. This is, again, a very important formula we will need to know by heart. This is a formula for the geodesic uh, for a preferred curve by, the, by, by uh, a given geometry. A more fancy way to write down this equation is to write it as del x dot x dot mu is equal to zero. It simply tells you that the covariant derivative of the tangent vector in the direction of this tangent vector, so in the direction of this curve over here, this is supposed to be equal to zero. That's a different way to think about this equation over here. Or there's a yet different way to think about it. 
we simply mean that the tangent vector for this curve is at the same time parallel transported along this curve uh, at any time. Uh, as initial data, we usually take a point. So at lambda zero, we take the coordinates of our point P. And for dx mu over d lambda, we take the components of the tangent vector we assume at P. Okay, uh, geodesics are supposed to be the counterparts of straight lines in the Minkowski and Euclidean geometry. And in fact, they share a lot of properties with, with straight lines. Uh, the first fairly simple one is the fact that the length of the tangent vector, meaning x dot mu, x dot mu, contract with the metric, or the product of x dot with itself. This is conserved along each of these geodesics. And this, of course, means that in the Lorentzian signature we are working with, uh, the geodesics naturally separate into time-like, null, and space-like, just like straight lines in the Minkowski space. If our geodesic starts, starts as a time-like geodesic, x dot mu is a time-like vector, it will remain so all along the geodesic. If it starts as a null one, it will remain null. If it is space-like initially, it will remain space-like. So the world of geodesics splits into three possible cases, the time-like geodesic, which will correspond to the motions of massive particles, null geodesic, which will correspond to the light rays, and space-like geodesic without a nice um, physical interpretation. Uh, it's always possible to reparameterize our given geodesic uh, by performing an affine transformation of the parameter lambda. So we pass from lambda to some kind of lambda prime, given by an affine, trans mm, affine uh, transformation of lambda. So a lambda plus b would a b equal to constant. In that case, we rescale our tangent vector, obviously, because we're rescaling our lambda. However, if two geodesics share a point p, and we know that initially the tangent vectors are proportional to each other with some kind of proportionality alpha, then we also know that they will share the same path, meaning they, they, they are the same geodesic up to our parameterization. Any questions to this? Okay, none. Just like in case of straight lines in Minkowski space, for non-null geodesics, we have a preferred parameterization. We can impose that x dot mu, x dot mu g mu nu is equal to minus one for time-like geodesics or plus one for space-like ones. However, there is no preferred parameterization for null geodesics. We cannot perform any, any normalization. Mm. In classical mechanics, uh, you typically learn that many of the uh, many of laws of mechanics or, or or many of laws of classical physics can be recovered from some kind of variational principle. Uh, you simply assume that uh, you've got your initial and your final state, and you ask what kind of motion would it take for the, for the for your system to, to to pass from one point to the other. And it turns out that in many cases you can recover the differential equations governing your physical system. For example, the Maxwell's equations, um, the equations of motion of a massive particle in a field uh, from a Lagrangian. So. There is, a, there is a quantity called action, which is an integral of uh, a Lagrangian function. And the true, the physical trajectory between the two, points, the two points is the one in which S is extremized or at least stationary. Meaning if you perturb your uh, physical uh, connecting curve slightly, the value of S does not change at linear order. Now, the geodesic equation can also be recovered from a simple variational principle. In fact, from many variational principles, but the simplest one is just that you take one half g mu nu, x dot mu, x dot mu. So you take the length of the, uh, the squared length of the geodesic, uh, of the tangent vector as your Lagrangian. And then the action, if you extremize the, if you take the uh, variation of the action with respect to the variation of your, of, of your curve, and look for stationary points, what you recover is the 
uh, geodesic equation. We will, in fact, check that probably during the next lecture. This is important because it turns out that very often the simplest strategy to obtain the gamma coefficients for a given metric is just to write down the Lagrangian for the, for the geodesic, calculate the Euler Lagrange equations for this given action, recast the resulting equations in this standard form, and then just read, read off the gamma coefficients from the equations we get. We will practice this during the next lecture. The physical interpretation of geodesics in GR is, is relatively simple. The time like geodesics corresponds simply to the word lines of free falling massive particles. So recall them, that in local inertial frame, geodesics have the, uh, the equation for geodesics is that the second derivative of the position with respect to lambda is equal to zero. So they behave like straight lines. And that's what we want from the, the uh, free falling particles. We talked about this when we discussed the uh, equivalence principle. Just like in, in Minkowski space, we assume that x dot mu, uh, if we assume that x dot mu, x dot mu is equal to minus one, so we've got the normalized parametrization, then the parametrization corresponds simply to the proper time as measured by our free falling observer. And in that case, x dot mu is called the four velocity, the x mu over d tau. We also define the four momentum as the mass uh, of the particle times u mu. Now geodesics, on the other hand, correspond to the word lines of massless particles like photons um, or to light rays. And they satisfy the equation that x dot mu times x dot mu is equal to zero all around a geodesic. OK. And that's the end of the uh, slides lecture, then, then we will do, uh, on the next hour, we'll do simply uh, a few calculation and now exercises um, regarding how you calculate the connection coefficients and so on. Uh, yeah, we have a 10 minute break now. We will meet at 10.06. Okay, so this is a break. Okay, so hello everyone, welcome the second part of the lecture. The second part of the lecture will be a Blackboard lecture, entirely a Blackboard lecture. So let me share my screen and show you the Blackboard. Okay. Let's go to the next page. So the next topic I wanted to discuss with you uh, are the, is the variation principle for geodesic equation. The geodesic equation. So let me begin by a short reminder about the a short review of the Euler Lagrange equations in general. So we assume we are given a Lagrangian function, which is a function of the positions uh, and the derivatives of the positions. And we are giving action, which is defined as the integral from, let's say, some lambda zero, lambda one of Lagrangian of x mu of lambda dx mu of the lambda. Of lambda, d lambda. And now we assume that we have fixed the initial and final value. So x mu of lambda of x mu of lambda one. But we allow the midpoints to vary. So we've got x mu of lambda of x mu of lambda one, and we have various possible connecting curves. Let's draw them with different colors.
uh, we would like to find the one for which this quantity S takes an extremal value, for example, the largest possible one, or at least it is stationary with respect to small deviations of, of your uh, of x mu. So we assume that we perturbed our curve a little, little bit, but not by much. So we take x mu of lambda into x mu of lambda plus delta x mu of lambda. Uh, the same goes for the derivative. Um, plus d over d lambda delta x mu of lambda. Just to keep the notation short, we'll call it delta x mu dot. And we asked about the, var the linear variation of this s. That's the integral of lambda o. So we have our given base x mu. We vary it with respect to some kind of delta x mu. And we see what happens to the action. Uh, so at linear order, we've got the perturbation of the position x mu and the perturbation of x dot. And this needs to be integrated with respect to the lambda. Uh, we keep the first term unchanged. But the second one, here we have the, the derivative with respect to lambda acting on delta x mu, and the integration and the integrations with respect to delta the lambda. It means that we can apply the integration by parts here. So create the derivative acting of delta on delta x mu for a derivative acting on, on dl over dx dot mu. And it seems it turns out to be a very useful move. So if we do it, what we get is d over d lambda acting on dl over dx dot mu times dx mu lambda. And then there's also, we there's a price we need to pay, and this is the uh, product of these two guys, dl over dx dot mu, delta x mu at points lambda zero, lambda one. But we have assumed that we have fixed the values of x mu at, pos at lambda zero and lambda one, which means that delta x mu is supposed to vanish at lambda zero and lambda one. So this guy does not contribute. So when we add these two terms together, what we get is something called the Euler-Lagrange equations. If this is supposed to be equal to zero, then, and this is supposed to be equal to zero for whatever delta x mu we may consider here, then this is supposed to be equal to zero. And from there, we obtain the Euler-Lagrange equations. We have to use a particular form of L to obtain the equations. And these are all the E's for uh, x mu, which extremizes the action. Mm. Any questions to this? I don't hear any, so let's go and and so now our Lagrangian is, if you remember, equal to the metric, which is a which depends on the position, we write this explicitly, times x dot mu, x dot mu. Now the question is the Euler-Lagrange equations, which as you remember, have the following form d over d lambda dl over d x dot mu minus dl over d x mu is supposed to be equal to zero. So there's four equations we are supposed to obtain, which extremize the integral of that. So let's begin with dl over dx mu. That's relatively easy. 
uh, we take the standard derivative of the metric. Uh, just one more thing. Instead of mu, I will use alpha. This mu is already here as the summation index. So it's better to use a slightly different one. X dot mu, x dot mu. Then we need to take the derivative with respect to delta x dot alpha. And here we will have two terms, one half g, let's say mu. Uh, taking derivative with respect to that guy will give us basically delta mu alpha, x dot mu. That, that, that's what happens when we uh, differentiate this thing with respect to delta x dot alpha. So the, the component mu, uh, differentiated by the component alpha is delta mu alpha because you get zero. These are different components, but one, this is the same component. And we've got the same thing going on for the other term of the product. So there's some kind of delta mu alpha. But G is a symmetric matrix, and we can combine, in fact, these two terms into a single one because they're in the end identical. This is just G mu alpha x dot. Mu. And this is because we can trade the contraction with mu alpha as we can write it as a contraction with mu, and we can also change the order of the indices. Okay, now we need to calculate d over d lambda, the derivative with respect to lambda of dl over dx dot alpha. Mm. So, first of all, D over the lambda may act on the components of the tangent vector, producing the second derivative. But that's not the end of the game, because we have to remember that G mu alpha is a function of, let's say, x sigma, the position, which is on itself a function of lambda. So there is an additional differentiation here with respect to, let's say, sigma x dot sigma, the derivative of x mu with respect to lambda, times x dot mu. We combine this with that and obtain the other Lagrange equations. x dot mu dot mu plus mu alpha sigma x dot sigma x dot mu. Um, Minus one half d mu x alpha x dot mu x dot mu. This is supposed to be equal to zero. Uh, we are pretty close now. Uh, there's just two things we need to do. So first, we mu multiply everything by the inverse metric in order to get rid of this metric in front of x double dot mu. So this will produce delta beta mu. So the contraction of this is that x double dot mu plus g alpha beta g mu alpha sigma x dot sigma x dot mu minus one half g mu mu alpha x dot mu x dot mu is equal to zero. Now it begins to look a little bit like the geodesic equation, especially when we perform the, uh, when we realize that this is just x double dot beta. We just need to make sure that this is the gamma term contracted twice with x dot x dot. But this is absolutely true for the following reason. Again, there is a bit of index manipulation here. Uh, x dot sigma x dot mu, uh, that's the same as, we can write it as twice the same term.
And we can also perform a small renaming of the indices of the summation indexes sigma and mu in the second term. Let's say we go here one half g mu alpha sigma x sigma x mu is the same as one half g sigma alpha mu x dot sigma x dot mu x dot mu x dot sigma but this is symmetric we can exchange the order of indices x dot sigma x dot mu okay Uh, let's go to the next one. We are left with x double dot beta plus. And let's go back over here. Yeah. plus g beta alpha. Mm. One half g plus one half g minus one half g alpha x plus mu x plus mu equal to zero. And here we have Um, mu alpha sigma x sigma x mu. mu alpha sigma x dot mu x dot sigma and here we have x sigma alpha mu x dot mu x dot sigma. Uh, I will just remain rename the, the, the index mu to sigma over here and we got that G beta alpha, G mu alpha sigma plus G sigma alpha mu minus G mu sigma alpha x dot mu x dot sigma equal to zero. Oof, and that's finally gamma beta. Uh, mu sigma and we should have a sigma here. Okay, good. We have proved that uh, taking that the variational principle uh, with the Lagrangian written over here indeed leads to the uh, geodesic equation for the x mu. Uh, any questions? Okay, everybody seems rather quiet today. Uh, so now we will uh, calculate the Christoffel symbols in, in, in a simple case. So Christoffel symbols for a two sphere. So we've got a two sphere of uh, of radius one, a standard sphere you, you know very well. The metric of the sphere is in the standard spherical coordinates to band five. It's d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. We will call this coordinate system YA. So this will be the coordinate one, this is the coordinate Y2. 
it means that the lower index metric is diagonal and rather simple. One, zero, zero, sine square theta. The upper index metric is again rather simple. One, zero, zero, sine theta to the power minus two. And now we calculate the Christopher symbols. Let me remind you the main equation. We'll use directly the, the first we'll use the method with the uh, exact expression for the Christopher symbols in terms of the first derivatives of the method. D, D, C plus G, D, C, D. So the first index is the one that is contracted with the uh, inverse metric over here. And then we've got this contracted index as the differentiation index, and we get DC here. Okay. Uh, so let's begin with the term gamma one, 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 or in other words, gamma theta, theta, theta. Sometimes instead of numbers, people write explicitly the names of the coordinates. Yeah, it, it, it kind of makes sense, as you will see. So we have the inverse metric over here, but the inverse metric is diagonal, which means that only the G11 or G theta theta component survives here. There is no theta phi, and it's actually equal to one, which is also very nice. Uh, and now here you will have theta Theta, derivative with respect to theta g, theta theta with respect to theta derivative minus g. Uh, theta theta with the theta, which is obviously g theta theta theta. But the Theta theta component or the one one component is constant. It has no derivative. It has vanishing all derivatives, so this is zero. Okay, so the first component turned out to be zero. Uh, the next would be gamma one one two, which is the same as gamma one two one by the way, which we can also call gamma theta theta phi. Uh, how do we calculate that? Well. We first have gamma theta theta, the upper index, which is equal to one. And then again, we have the bracket term. That's g theta theta phi minus g theta phi theta plus g theta phi with respect to theta. Okay. Again, we have the theta theta component, which is one, so this derivative is zero. We've got the theta phi component, which is zero, and here also zero. So disappointment, again, this one is also zero. So let's try now gamma one to two, which is gamma theta phi phi. We begin with gamma upper theta theta. And then we get gamma theta phi phi plus g theta phi phi minus g phi phi theta. That's great because this is zero, this is zero, but this guy is not vanishing because g. Phi phi is sine squared, which can be differentiated by theta and gives no zero value. This is basically minus two sine theta cos theta. So if we take into account this one half, this is minus sine theta cos theta. Good, we have found our first non-vanishing Christopher symbol. Any questions? None. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Gamma phi theta theta. 
since this is the first first of all symbols we talk about, I'll be very um, explicit with writing all possible uh, all possible steps we are, we are making here. So again, the mat the metric is diagonal, so the inverse metric is diagonal as well. And it's only the gamma phi phi component which survives, and here we get gamma phi theta theta plus gamma phi. The same with different order, but that's twice a little bit index, so it amounts to the same. And gamma theta theta phi. This is zero because the metric has no cross mixed terms. And the theta theta term, this is one, so this is also zero. Uh, there's a point one again. Okay. The only non vanishing one. is actually gamma phi theta phi. Uh, this you can also write as two one one here and this will be gamma two one two equal to gamma two one as well. Because of these guys being symmetric. So it's also gamma phi phi theta. So here we have again one half g phi phi. And that's, if I remember correctly, sine to the power of minus two. Yes, it's sine to the power of minus two. And then in the brackets, we have g phi theta phi plus g phi phi theta minus g theta phi phi. Zero, zero, but g phi phi theta, that's something that has potential for vanishing because this is Again, sine squared theta. Mm, so here we get two sine theta cos theta from the differentiation. And again, combining with this prefactor one half uh, sine theta to the power of minus two, we get cosine theta over sine theta, which is cotton theta. Yes. Uh, and the last one is g222 two, 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 equal to g555. Five, five, five. It actually vanishes, which is easy to see because this is one half g555. Five, five. And now we have three identical terms G five 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 plus G five 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 minus G five five five. So this this gives us this thing here, but G five five does not depend on phi, so this is zero. In, at the end of the day, it's only gamma two one two equal to gamma two two one equal to cotton theta, which doesn't vanish, and gamma. One to two, which doesn't vanish. All other components vanish. Yes. Any questions to this calculation over here? So this is a 
a bit of an ugly calculation or exercise, but it's good that you see exactly how, how this is how this is done in practice. That's something you'll need to also uh, do on during your homework a little bit. Okay, now we will use the second approach. Approach using the variational principle for the geodesic equation. So the idea is the following. We will simply derive the equations in this form. But written explicitly, we'll explicitly mention functions over here. And then we'll just read off the coefficients gamma a, b, c from, uh, from these equations, one after another. Uh, simply, if you, if you give somebody the geodesic equations in a given space time, uh, you can exp you can write, read off all possible components of the gammas just from, from what we get. We will see it in a second. And we will get, we will obtain this form of the geodesic equation by solving, uh, by deriving the Euler Lagrange equations. So in case of the, the sphere, the Lagrangian is one half theta dot squared plus times for pi dot square. That's one half the metric y dot a, y dot b. Okay, and we calculate explicitly dl over d theta. The first term doesn't contribute, the second term does contribute. It contributes two sine theta cos theta pi dot square with one half, so just it's a sine theta uh, cos theta pi dot square. Let's calculate. The bottom line is that this, it may look surprising, but this is usually the fastest way to obtain your connection coefficients in, in, in the end. Uh, nothing depends on phi in this expression, so this is equal to zero dl over d theta dot. Uh, so here, only the first term here contributes and contributes uh, one half of two theta dot, which is just theta dot. And dl over d phi dot, well, that contributes sine square theta. We don't touch this prefactor, but there's a phi dot here. So the Euler Lagrange equations. Or this Lagrangian. Uh, first, we take the derivative of this guy with respect to lambda. This is just the double dot minus the L over the theta. So this is minus sine theta cosine theta pi dot squared. This is zero. Then we have the derivative of this with respect to lambda, and that's a bit more complicated. We get sine squared theta pi double dot. But there's also this guy over here, which we need to differentiate. This will give us two sine theta cos theta theta dot pi dot minus the L over the phi, which is zero, and this is supposed to be zero. Okay, it's almost in this form, except for the sine square theta, so we divide by one over sine square theta. And the second equation takes a nicer form, phi double dot plus two. Uh, when, the, when, uh, when we divide by sine square theta, we get two cotangent theta, theta dot phi dot equal to zero. Okay. Very nice. Now you have to look at these equations over here. This one 
on this one and compare it with that one. So let's begin with the uh, first component. So it should be basically theta double dot plus gamma theta a b y dot a y dot b equal to zero. I am mixing the theta and, and the numbered components in the notation here, but I hope it's not very confusing. Okay, it seems that indeed it has this form, but there's only one non-vanishing term here, and namely the one which corresponds to uh, contraction with y dot two or phi dot. So the only thing that survives here is just gamma theta phi phi, and it's equal to minus sine theta cos theta. All other vanish. Now let's look at this guy over here. That will correspond to y2 double dot or phi double dot plus appropriate gamma phi. Again, contracted with this type of product. This should give zero and this is fine. But here we recognize that the gamma theta theta phi, that should be the cotangent theta. Uh, note that there is no two over here because gamma theta theta phi enters twice in this summation. First, when you take gamma theta theta phi theta dot phi dot, but again, when you have gamma theta phi dot, uh, gamma theta phi, phi dot theta dot. In this summation, it enters twice because it's a symmetric matrix. And we have to remember that. So there is no, there is a prefactor to in this equation, but there is no in gamma because it enters twice anyway. Okay, and again, sorry, this should be phi. And again, gamma phi a beta others are equal to zero. Great, and we have our solution fairly quickly just with one page. You can check that it's exactly the same as we had before. So especially when your metric has a diagonal form or some kind of special form, this method of calculating the uh, Christoffel symbols by deriving the Euler Lagrange equations for geodesics. This works really, really well and it's much faster and much less error prone than using directly the expression from the lecture. Any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions. So let's do a second example I prepared today. Uh, it will be called the Newtonian approximation. So this example is a bit of looking ahead. It's a metric in the following form. This time it's a full four dimensional Lorentzian metric. G V T squared equal to one plus two pi plus the X squared plus the Y squared plus the Z squared one minus two pi. Pi is a function which depends just on the position x, y, z, which I will also call x, y, with y being equal to 1, 2, 3. And this will be also known as x, 0. OK. So the lower index met metric is minus 1, minus 2, pi. 0, 0, and t, 1, 1, equal to g, 2, 2, equal to g, 3, 3. That's equal to 1 minus 2, 5. All other vanish. That's the metric. 
And the inverse metric is fairly easy to calculate. That's just one plus five, one, one equals two G two two equals two G. Two, three. That's one over one minus two five. All other vanish. So for very small values of phi, which is a dimensional thing, this metric is supposed to uh, somehow represent the uh, represent gra relativistic gravity. But in situations when masses are small, velocities are small. And we should somehow recover the Newtonian gravity from here, with five being pretty much the Newtonian potential. So the question is the gamma coefficients, the geodesic equation. We will derive this metric more rigorously later, but at the moment we use it as an example. Okay, so let's do. A direct calculation. That's one half G alpha beta. G beta mu mu plus G beta mu mu minus P mu mu beta. We begin with gamma zero zero zero. That's one half G zero zero. Then we'll have the sum of three identical terms, G0, 0, 0, 0 plus G0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 with the minus, so we are left with G0, 0, 0, 0. But differentiation with respect to zero is differentiation with respect to time. And here we assume that these five coefficients are all uh, constant in time. They depend only on the position, so this is zero. Mm. We go to this one. On the other hand, let's calculate the zero zero i with i being equal to one to three. There's something very nice about this metric, namely, it treats all three spatial components exactly at the same footing. If you calculate the derivative with respect to one, the derivative with respect to two will look exactly the same. There's a perfect symmetry between these, these x, y, and z components, and we can explore that here. Uh, yeah, so we have one half g zero zero, g zero zero i plus g zero i zero. The first zero is the one which matches G0, 0, 0 here. Again, the metric is diagonal, so there's just G0, 0, 0, 1 term over here, which is very nice. Diagonal metrics are very, very nice things. And here we get G0, I, 0. Let's transfer up with this one. And we get G0, 0, I. But this time, this doesn't vanish. So we have 1 half. One minus one over one plus two pi. That's g upper zero zero. And here we get. If you look carefully here, g zero zero y is just minus two pi derivative with respect to y. Okay, so when we get rid of the factors, this is what we get. And now assuming that phi is a very, very small number and so is derivative, at the leading order, we can approximate it. We can get rid of this phi in the denominator and this is just phi divided by, uh, uh, differentiate with respect to i. Mm. Okay. Which one are we going to calculate again? Okay, this one is fairly trivial. We can do it back home. This is equal to zero. 
this one is a little bit more complicated, gi zero zero. Again, i is one to r two. We can handle them with this one expression. And this is gi i. I will I will make an underscore here, meaning simply that I am not. I'm underlining the, the indices. This simply means that I'm not doing a, a nice transformation over here. And here we have G uh, I zero zero plus G I zero zero minus G zero zero I. Again, I'm not doing a summation over here. It's just G one one, G one zero, blah, blah, for I put one, G two two, G two zero one. Zero for four. There's no summation here. There's no summation because uh, this is a diagonal matrix, and for each particular value of i, only the i i component survives. And then this is equal to zero because the i zeros are zero. And we are left with minus p o o i. So this is one half g upper i i. What's this? One over one minus two five. And then we've got minus g zero zero i here. And G0, zero zero i is minus two pi i. This is differentiation with respect to i. Okay, and we got pi i divided by one minus two pi, which is pi i plus quadratic terms in pi. Okay, what is a bit more difficult technically is calculating gamma i j k. And here I would like to proceed a bit differently because that's the simplest method. You just take gamma one, two, three. So I'm choosing particular indices. That's one half G one one G one two three plus G one three two minus P two three one. Okay, and we have just the mixed uh, indices in the metric here, but the metric is diagonal, so each of these is zero, so this is zero. And that's very nice. Yeah. And this also this is also got to G1 3 2. But we can apply exactly the same argument for any gamma. So we have just three different spatial indices. So G2 3 1 equals to G3 1 2. It's also equal to zero. Exactly for the same reason. You just repeat what is what, what we have done here. Mm. Mm. Gamma one one one, that's not a trivial one. That's G. Again, we have everything boils down just to the we have three terms which boil down just to this one over here because we have three identical indices here. And that's one half one over one minus two pi. I think it's a minus. No, we get five. And here we have two one one over one. That's minus two pi.
Mm, it's minus pi one, one minus two pi. And we can approximate as, as one minus pi one. And obviously we can repeat it for the other two sp spatial indices. Okay, two more things to go are gamma one, two, two. P1, two, two, and this is taken twice, because here we have the same index, minus G2, two, two, one, this is zero. That's one half, one over one plus minus two pi. Uh, minus G2, two, two over one, minus two pi over one. Okay, and this will be a plus by one over one minus two pi. Is it correct? We'll just pi divided by one. And the same goes also for one, two, three, but also gamma two, one, one, gamma two, three, three, et cetera. It's easy to see that this is just the derivative with this upper index here. Mm. Okay, I will not continue here. Let me just point out that you can write this down, the spatial parts in a slightly more fancy way. Um, this is just minus delta ij pi prime, minus delta i pi ij plus pi i delta j pi. In the second step, I would like to do, redo this calculation and check if it's correct uh, using the variational principle, but that's a long calculation. It's, there's just three minutes to go and I think it doesn't make much sense. So thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions to the whole lecture? It was very highly computational. It was, especially the second part was very much uh, a, com a complicated blackboard computations exercise, a complicated tensor algebra exercise, but it's a part of GR. You have to be able to um, to calculate the Christoffel symbols of metrics of this kind. Um, that's an important part. Okay, so yeah. Mm, see you next week then. Uh, and thank you very much.